Today, I want to take you on a journey, and it's an interesting journey. Um, for decades now, people with uh, disabilities, disabled Canadians, have been involved in human rights acquisition for disabled people at the national and international level. Today, we're tracing the historical shift in, dis in the disability rights landscape from recipients of charity moving to social justice, citizenship rights, ad advocates, and activism. However, the path toward rights has been far from direct. And uh, in these days of a global pandemic, uh, the outcome a very um, less than secure. As the Human Rights uh, uh, Disability Rapporteur from the UN has said, people with disabilities are often wrongly perceived to be inherently vulnerable when it is attitudinal, environmental, and institutional barriers that result in situations of vulnerability. While many persons with disabilities have health conditions that uh, may make them more susceptible to COVID-19, uh, pre-existing discrimination and inequality means that uh, persons with disabilities are one of the most excluded groups in terms of health uh, prevention and response actions and economic and social support measures and among um, the hardest hit in terms of risk, uh, uh, actual uh, transmission and actual fatalities. Um, uh, to this point, uh, people with disabilities have paid a terrible price during this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, particularly when human beings are reduced to a single element, the elderly and the vulnerable, uh, it, it, over, it uh, oversimplifies our quality of life and worthiness to live. Um, and we are receiving uh, mixed messages. We are told at the same time we're going to be protected, but when, um, when access to goods, services, and health um, services are called into question, we are deemed to be disposable a lot of the time. But we've been here before. What, what happens when human beings are reduced to a single arbitrary factor or a narrow scale of usefulness? Certain forms of physicality are valued and others are not. There is a strange form of social distancing that takes place validating differential treatment and service delivery, drawing ever shifting lines between us and them, and the devaluation uh, making arbitrary distinctions much easier. The dark realities uh, have worked to embolden the uh, disability social justice movement. Unfortunately, for the most part, our society does not put disability and disability issues on the same rights uh, continuum as other marginalized groups such as race, gender, or sexuality. As yet, uh, uh, disability is not usually seen as a social justice issue. Rights are accorded, uh, rights accorded to disabled people are often linked to a charity ethic. We are told that it's lucky, it's better than nothing, and it's better than it used to be. We disabled uh, people have been accorded a singular black identity framed around a lack of utility or in burden. This singular identity is often code for lack of social utility or worth. And in these neoliberal times of uh, individual responsibility, yet again, this has become all too clear in recent months shortly after the pandemic was declared in a suburb of Toronto, a large number of care workers left an institution. They no longer felt safe. And uh, as a result, disabled people were left inside. These are not simply the actions of a few frightened self-absorbed employees, rather a graphic example of a larger systemic discard for a segment of the population either um, disabled and or elderly. And it's important to remember that uh, um, elderly people often have some form of disability in long-term care homes. Um, in a similarly, in a Montreal suburb, elderly occupants of a care home were discovered in conditions of profound squalor. And relatedly, 
uh, Jean Turchin, uh, one of the individuals who had petitioned uh, the Quebec court for wider access to uh, medical assistance in dying, chose to, ex chose to expedite his assisted death rather than enduring the conditions in his nursing home. Disabled people have experienced, uh, have not experienced the same degree of legislative advancement as other marginalized population groups. Differential treatment on the basis of disability is not framed as discrimination, but simply the way things have always been done. Uh, disability rights often remain add-ons or afterthoughts. In large measure, we occupy the leftover spaces that nobody else wants. Um, for, and for the most part, these spaces are not of our choosing. The lack of expectation echoes the charity ethic that underpins the bulk of existing uh, services and policy framework. Historically, uh, disabled people have not um, been seen in need of rights protection. As uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur puts it, despite significant advances in the in right, uh, the recognition of rights for persons with disabilities at the international and national levels, the deeply rooted negative perceptions about value of the lives of their lives um, continue to, uh, to be a prevalent obstacle in all societies. Those perceptions are ingrained in what is known as ableism. So how did we disabled people get here? It is an ongoing here in this ongoing quest for equality. It has been over a century in the making and we are not there yet. It's important to remember that the quest, um, the advocacy quest and rights quest can be found in the most unlikely spaces. As a matter of fact, starting in 1918 with advocating for services for people blinded by the Halifax explosion, and blind veterans returning from World War I, which led to the founding of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind in 1930 and saw the passage of the Blind Veterans Act. We have to build a more complete picture about what was happening with rights acquisition at the same time that disabled people were advocating for their own rights. For example, the famous five most uh, recognized for um, acquiring voting rights for white women. At the same time, the famous five were actively advocating eugenics for disabled people and people labeled as different. Um, going on, parents and families um, of people with intellectual disabilities as far back as beginning in the 1930s in various provinces advocated for their children to have uh, programs and services. And uh, veterans returning from World War II, disabled veterans returning from World War II were also active in uh, demanding rights. The Canadian Paraplegic Association in 1945 was founded and prior, um, and they worked with the CNIB to advocate for uh, programs and services for um, disabled veterans. It's important to remember too that at that time fewer than 10 percent of uh, people who had spinal cord injuries survived more than a year and there's a, a, if I can digress for a second there's an underlying sort of social perception that disability can be equated with social social death in certain circumstances and I in my view it echoes the um, understanding that disabled people um, have very short uh, lifespans and have little social involvement. Okay. The needle began to shift slowly in the 1960s and 70s uh, with disabled veterans returning from Vietnam and the um, growth of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. The Council of uh, Canadians with Disabilities was formed, earlier known as COPO. Um, it was founded in the 1970s and it marked the first time that it was a disability-led organization and it was not it was not uh, signified by a disability label of any particular type. 
um, they advocated for um, elements such as the Canadian Human Rights Act, an accessible transportation system, um, access to goods and services, uh, and um, so that people with disabilities could have access to daily life activities just as non-disabled people do. However, uh, um, it was a long haul. In 1980, saw the founding of Disabled People International in uh, Winnipeg, and it marked the first, um, one of the first uh, times that a, a global approach to disability rights was begun. People, uh, disabled people wanted to take rights acquisition into their own hands, and uh, they wanted to move away from the medicalized understanding that had uh, permeated uh, ideas around uh, and uh, service provision around disability to that point. Uh, 1981 was also pivotal. It was the International Year of Persons with Disabilities. And it served as a catalyst for disability-led groups such as uh, the, uh, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities and um, other related groups to push for social justice and, uh, and civil rights on the legislative level. Disabled people reporting to commissions and committees were uh, tasked with exploring uh, disability and disability issues for the very first time beyond the charity and uh, duty of care for the so-called vulnerable. Direct testimony from disabled uh, people made the barriers and disadvantages we often face uh, on a daily basis real for the very first time because before this point and still today there was an assumption that um that disabled people were only were very few in number and it was basically a crisis response approach an individualized approach approach to disability issues um for the uh, uh excuse me yeah uh, testimony uh concerning their daily lives made it real. The reality of poverty, lack of access to transportation, housing and employment. And um, there was a uh, move towards social citizenship and uh, beyond passive recipients of care. The obstacles report that came out of this um, testimony uh, documented the profound disadvantage and despite some improvement over the years, it remains prevalent today with low levels of education, employment, uh, disabled, many disabled people uh, live below the poverty line. Also during this time, uh, there was uh, Statistics Canada came to the fore with the beginning of quantification of, of disabled people uh, and disability services and the whole point of quantification makes it imp is important because it also reinforces that uh, disability is real. It's important to remember that we are the world's largest um, minority group over 1 billion in number and as of uh, uh, 2018 we've been uh, in Canadian population, the working age level of disability is 22%. Um, so we're not just some tiny minority. Uh, it also, uh, going back to um, the international year, it also served as a catalyst for federal building code leg legislation um, and access to transportation. Inclusion of people with disabilities in, in uh, the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was also an important um, move forward. However, it, was, uh, it also was not straightforward. At the start, many federal ministers did not grasp the need for uh, disability rights protection and uh, discrimination on the basis of disability was not really recognized. Um, 
uh, disabled people had to uh, disabled groups such as um, the Council of Canadians with Disabilities had to do things like occupying the visitors gallery, which was not accessible at the time, which meant that uh, disabled um, people had to be carried in and out of, of the um, visitors gallery. It, it also meant that uh, ministers were intensively lobbied to the point that um, um, disabled activists followed ministers to the toilet to make their point on the, on the need for uh, including uh, disability in the charter of, uh, to be recognized in the charter of rights and, excuse me, the equality rights provisions of the charter. And it marked the very first time that uh, disability rights were recognized in a constitutional document. What's important to remember too, is just because one has, uh, one has rights on paper, it's, it doesn't mean that those rights are articulated on the ground effectively or understood, or there's a, a mechanism to make them work. Because uh, with uh, the equality rights provisions, there was no mechanism for non-compliance. And for the most part, many disabled people still rely on provincial and federal human rights legislation. However, what's important to, uh, and what's important to remember about that is it takes on average from three to five years for um, a human rights complaint to be seen through to fruition. And also a human, the human rights process is very, an in, is very individualized, which means that the, um, the, there is not a lot of carry through to the larger population group. An individual's rights may be dealt with, may be recognized, but that does not carry through to the larger population uh, very often. It's important to remember that the bulk of, of complaints received um, within the human rights are now disability related. In, uh, in uh, 1985, Don Canada was formed, the Disabled Women's Network. Uh, it was founded by 11 women coming together to, uh, to bring uh, women, uh, disabled women's rights to the fore. And they have been instrumental in um, underlying um, problems uh, that disabled women face, such as domestic violence, access to health care, um, and access to the legal system. Uh, most, and they've, uh, Dawn has worked effectively with other women's rights organizations, such as the uh, Legal Action Education Fund for Women. And most recently, they've been involved with um, the uh, Arch Disability Law Center and intervened uh, to bring um, to bring a notice to the experience of uh, women with intellectual disabilities and sexual assault, making their um, testimony recognized in the law, because quite frequently, women with intellectual disabilities, people with intellectual disabilities, their uh, testimony has been discounted in uh, legal situations. So uh, uh, this has been important to bring this to the fore. Excuse me, I'm a bit nervous here. Okay. Um, in 1986, Independent Living Canada was formed, bringing uh, the need for uh, disability control uh, access to goods and services and support, self-direction to the fore, very important, so that people with disabilities would have control over the services and uh, supports they need for, uh, to participate in daily life, uh, daily living activities. Uh, again, this, this is documenting the shift bit from uh, passivity to um, control and autonomy. That's what's important here. Um, in uh, the next thing, the next thing to, uh, to come to the fore, the next element 
uh, was uh, is People First, 1991. It was it's a disability-led organization by individuals with cognitive disabilities, and uh, this group has been instrumental in leading uh, the push to close um, institutions um, for people with intellectual disabilities across the country, moving toward uh, community-based um, group homes, um, which have, are less institutional in nature. Most, um, the most significant uh, piece of rights legislation uh, that has had um, the greatest impact on, or can have potentially the greatest impact on um, uh, the positioning, uh, the social positioning where disabled people find themselves is the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. And what's, in, uh, what's so important about this, it marks the first time that disabled people have been directly involved in the, the formulation of uh, disability rights legislation. They were involved from the beginning in its construction. And it is very much a social justice, social citizenship uh, piece of legislation. And that language is reflected throughout. In 2010, Canada signed the legislation and in 2017, uh, and they signed the optional protocols. And what's important to recognize is that disabled Canadians were directly involved in its formulation and implementation. And in 2017, the um, optional protocols were signed, which, which gave um, the initial convention more force in law and meant that uh, um, meant that legislation had to be at least um, looked at through a disability lens and disability had to be considered when federal legislation is um, formulated. However, Canada has had a mixed history with uh, with regards to uh, rights implementation. Uh, the latest report uh, from the UN Rapporteur on Disability Issues uh, uh, says that Canada has um, far to go to meet the protocol and ha has, um, excuse me, Canada has a long way to go and has not yet met the tenets of the legislation. Okay. Um, what's important here? Conclusion. The naturalness and acceptance of exclusion and disadvantage for disabled people is disturbing. There are important questions that must be asked going forward and in com uncomfortable conversations that must be had in order to substantively improve and rectify the current situation of disabled people. This may be disruptive to the established social, cultural comfort zone. However, we must ask ourselves, who is really uncomfortable here? How do we decide who counts and who doesn't? Who is readily made invisible and discounted? Uh, we are in the midst of triage systems that specifically downgrade uh, treatment priority for disabled people. As a disabled person, this is not simply a theoretical discussion. My life quite literally depends on it. The respect to courted disability issues and disabled people is in the process of becoming, it is not yet here. At best, we are slowly moving toward tolerance and not acceptance, and certainly not inclusion, particularly when the majority feels threatened. The discussion has begun, but there's a ways yet to go. Thank you.